It's Wes, welcome to this video. Today we're gonna to be talking about my experiences renting the Canon C70 and using it for the first time, which I did last weekend. Let's get straight into it. You're a beautiful person and a good person. And if no one has told you that today, let me be the first one to tell you that. All right, in a recent video, I reviewed some of the key specs that make the Canon C70 interesting for anyone who's interested in a dedicated cinema camera. And it was a video that shared my thoughts from research and study, um, but not real life experience. Today, I'm back to share with you what sticks with me after a whirlwind couple of days, hands-on with the camera. Two themes stand out from this experience, the versatility and the accessibility. So while those might seem a little abstract, let me draw a more concrete picture for you. What stands out is Canon has packed into the camera a rich feature set that helps create an all-in-one filmmaking package. That's one. As well, Canon has moved to the outside of the camera. Those accessible controls are at your fingertips now. I tested the camera a little bit on the ride from where we picked it up in LA uh, downtown to out near the Venice skate park. And by that time, about an hour into having my hands on the Canon C70, I had enough of a familiarity to use it at the Venice Skate Park. And I wandered around the beach for almost an hour uh, in and out of the sights and the sounds of Venice Beach. I ended up at the Venice Skate Park. So that was one time using it. And then I didn't get to use it again until Sunday evening with a real estate shoot. And third, I used it a tiny bit outside of my house uh, doing a, an audio and autofocus test. Um, this is a tiny bit of experience and it's probably total three to four hours hands-on. So take everything I'm going to say with a grain of salt, run it through the filter of this is Wes's first impressions. And this is my first time hands-on with any cinema camera. So keep that in mind as well. However, I hope this video is useful to you. I'm gonna start by discussing low light and dynamic range performance, which was the number one requested area to address in this video. After talking about low light uh, performance and dynamic range, I'm gonna address key features of the camera that stands out to me in terms of performance. In no particular order, onboard audio power and options, built-in ND filter, the amazing layout of the external function buttons, compatibility with RF lenses. And to close, I'm gonna highlight three features I've honestly never used before, false color, shutter angle, and focus lock. This video is atypical for me in that uh, most often I'm examining what you might use a camera for, then I look at the performance, and then finally I examine the price. This is my UPP, <laughs> use performance price mantra. Um, but you know this camera is dedicated to filmmaking and video production. And the price, that's a known quantity, 5,500. So let's get busy talking about performance. Of course, at the end, I'm gonna share my final thoughts personally on how I feel about the price and the use given what renting it revealed to me. All right, so in no particular order, the onboard audio power and options, I used the Rode NTG4 and I was shocked at how delicious the audio sounded. I can use this audio with the Fuji X-T4, yes, and the Canon EOS R, yes, but the C70 allowed me to input this high quality audio signal straight into the camera via the XLR connection and then the XLR to mini XLR cable that comes with the camera. If you wanted, you could actually mix a lav mic and a shotgun mic for ambient sound and send one left and one right for two audio tracks. And then you could have control over those and adjust those in post-production. Again, it's something you could do with an external audio recorder like the Zoom H6, but again, that's another piece of gear. And that's gonna be a theme that comes over and over. That's what I mean about the all-in-one filmmaking package that the C70 is. So all this said about the, the controls and flexibility and power in the inputs, you better study that audio input and configuration menu. There's options to clarify and to choose from. Gone are the days when you plug in the shotgun mic or the Rode Go, adjust the manual input to the desired uh, level and off you go. This is an audio handling machine. So you have built-in mic, input terminal, mic terminal options. And the life lesson is you actually need the proper vocabulary to ingest, process, and work through the menu. That's a theme over and over I found coming from the mirrorless DSLR world into the cinema camera world. You actually need to build your vocabulary to understand the menus better. I found over and over the Canon C70 spoke a different dialect, if not a language, about half the time. Now this didn't stop me from communicating with the camera, but it did slow me down. All right, onto the built-in ND filter. No fuss, no muss. There are two, four, six, eight, and 10 stop ND filters. That's a lot of power and versatility built in. So you can do what you need to do without bringing extra filters and gear with you. Again, 
it's all in the camera. And they're super simple to activate. You can just drop in a filter with the push of a plus button, remove it by hitting the minus button, both handily located in a vertical orientation on the side. Hit plus and darken this frame by two stops. Hit minus and you're back where you started. Hit plus twice and you darken the frame by four stops. Hit minus twice, you're back where you started. It's simple and easy to work with. And that's something I love, honestly. Filmmaking's hard enough. Let the camera solve a lot of problems for you. That's a great segue to the amazing layout of the external function buttons. Man, everything is handily and clearly laid out and labeled with fairly large white numbers that don't totally impinge on the camera's aesthetics, but they're so helpful, especially when you're learning your way around the camera, like me. I think there are 12 large buttons that can be mapped to almost anything you want in the camera, but which come labeled with some obvious choices like white balance, ISO, magnification, etc. You simply depress the button and then the top dial is activated to quickly scroll through the values for that setting. It's easy. I had a quick call during my real estate shoot with Tony Mellinger, another YouTuber. I'll put a link to his channel up here or below in the description. I was actually messaging him a few questions in a row and he just video called me. It was probably getting hard to keep up with my newbie questions. He told me he maps the false color function to button 12 and the focus lock to button 11. And I got off the call with him and immediately set those and used them the rest of the shoot. That was a handy tip. Thanks, Tony. We're actually gonna to get to the false color and focus lock features later. So you scroll to the icon that looks like a big button on the menu. I only had that camera a couple days. I actually never found out how to activate the touch menu. But you can touch the icon that looks like a big button Then there's numbered buttons and you just select okay and you get a list of what you want it to be. It's actually harder to explain it than it is to adjust the custom buttons. Uh, the ones I found useful were magnification, so you can punch in and check your, your focus, um, ISO, false color, and focus lock. All right, moving on. Compatibility with the RF lenses is a huge win. This is a big, big win. I tested the RF 15 to 35 lens alongside the Sigma 18 to 35, and I noticed definitely an increased responsiveness in terms of handling autofocus on the RF lenses. I thought the Sigma would be the clear winner since I could go wider in terms of aperture, and I thought that would be helpful in the low light setting of the real estate shoot. But the RF lens had two major strengths, and one was stabilization, which was a noticeable benefit both at the skate park and in the real estate video. And then the other was a more responsive autofocus. However, when I discovered how far I could push the low light capabilities and C-Log3, I opted for the RF lens because I didn't actually need that extra stop of light from the camera. The C70's low light and dynamic range performance actually allowed me to stick with the lens I preferred in a dark scene and in a bright scene. More on this later. Okay, it's time to shed some light on my reaction to some of the cinema camera features I found particularly enjoyable, rewarding, encouraging, and helpful. False color, focus lock, and shutter angle. With false color mapped to the button F11 with the push one button, you can see in blue and purple the dark shadows bordering on losing data, and highlights in red and orange where you're also bordering on losing data. Now in the real estate shoot, I didn't have a human subject in my frame, but you would first use this readout to make sure your human subject skin tones are properly exposed, meaning they appear gray in the false color readout. And then you work your way to just the other areas. Here's my experience with false color. The camera was able to communicate to me quickly and accurately, much more than a histogram, zebras, or the LCD view, what was properly exposed. Now, my experience is that I'm conservative with ISO settings and what changed for me using false color is I kept rolling the ISO up and up and up until I saw the false color readout showing a much lighter and more balanced exposure. The footage was coming out much better exposed and full, dis full disclosure, I didn't have as much success as I would have liked color grading the footage, but I'm on a learning journey with C-Log3. The shock to me is that ultimately I saw my ISO was 4,000. The footage looked all right. More than that, it looked right. And without false color, my hopes of creating a real estate video would have been totally and completely unrealized. All right, now moving on to focus lock. I used to use focus lock all the time when I was shooting DSLRs to focus and recompose. This was typically executed with a center autofocus point set. I used a half button, press to focus, and then I would hold autofocus lock, move to recompose the shot. And I used to do this all the time. Then the Canon EOS R came into my hands and I no longer had to focus and recompose because I could simply touch and drag the focal point 
anywhere I wanted on the screen. It was amazing, and more than that, it was, it was liberating, honestly. However, since doing much more filmmaking recently and developing that muscle, I have not used focus lock, which allows you to get a particular part of your scene in focus, and then you can move the camera without having the focus point jump to another part of the scene. So for example, I can get the chair in the middle of the frame in focus, then I can pan so the chair moves to the edge of the frame, but the chair does not slip out of focus because the camera is picking up a new object and, and shifting focus to that. So the focus is locked. Or for example, I can focus on one object on the counter or table and hold focus lock and walk forward and the focus stays just like it would in manual focus. But the, here's the thing, it's so much easier to hold the focus lock button as function button 12 right underneath the lens, where my hand is anyway supporting the camera, than it is to find the manual focus uh, switch, uh, manual focus to autofocus switch on the barrel of the lens. And which lens you're using puts it in a slightly different spot and then you have to move your hand so there's no way to get muscle memory uh, finely tuned uh, to move those switches back and forth. This solution is easy, it's simple, and graceful. It's a great new discovery. I'm actually gonna see if I can map my Fuji X-T4's focus lock button to a handy custom button. Looking forward to try this out. And finally, the shutter angle feature. Wow, this really puzzled me because at first on the LCD screen, I couldn't pick up where the shutter speed was. I just didn't recognize the, the readout, but it's because it's showing shutter angle. I actually shot all the footage on Saturday at Venice Skate Park at a 22.5 shutter angle or something like that, which means my shutter speed was actually very fast, which is part of the reason I didn't struggle with the exposure shooting on a bright afternoon toward the setting sun. Well, that and the ND filters that you can turn on with the click of a button. Beginner's luck. Now, I'm used to the rule that you're to keep your shutter speed at double your frame rate. Shooting at 24 frames per second, you use one over 48 or one over 50, so motion blur looks natural. If you're shooting slow motion footage, like 60 or 120 frames per second, you're gonna shoot at one over 120 or one over 240, for example. However, if you're using this shutter angle setting on your Canon C70, you set your aperture, you set your ISO, and the camera, the camera will automatically adjust the shutter angle to make sure you're getting a proper, properly exposed exposure. So in other words, it takes the guesswork out of the exposure triangle. It takes the shutter speed out of your hands. Again, I'm so grateful for all of the new learning. I'm appreciative, absolutely appreciative of the capabilities of the Canon C70 that creates a versatile and accessible filmmaking experience. Delightful. So in conclusion, uh, everyone I've talked to raves about the camera. My experience, if you're looking for a dedicated camera for filmmaking, this is it. This is a compact powerhouse, and it really holds its own next to the bigger Canon uh, cinema cameras. Highly, highly recommended. If this is your first time on the channel or a return visit and you haven't subscribed, please hit subscribe and new videos every week on Canon and Fuji. Leave me a comment and let me know what you think about the Canon C70. And uh, also, if you liked any part of this video, hit the like button. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.